Buckle in. This is going to be the full lecture on uh, things that we need to know as teachers about uh, teaching and learning the alphabet. Uh, the first thing that uh, we want to emphasize is that uh, much research over the past 30 years has shown that uh, knowing the names of the alphabet letters in early grades, kindergarten and first grade, is a good predictor of later reading achievement. Uh, so it's totally reasonable uh, that we give children a strong opportunity to learn all the letter names while they're learning to read and write. And you won't find anybody out there arguing with this, but you also won't find a lot of people who have all of the information on what people need to know about the alphabet. So uh, one question that I always have is, wouldn't it be better to just teach the letter sounds instead of sometimes confusing letter names? Uh, the answer apparently is no. Uh, actually having a name for those letters is a good predictor of reading success even uh, if we have to uh, work on letter sounds after that. Uh, so letter sounds uh, and phonemes, just knowing the sounds themselves, those are all good predictors of, uh, of learning to read, but knowing these names is important. So why is it uh, that knowing the letter names is important if we could just skip over the names and just go directly to, to teaching the sounds? So one reason that the letter names is, uh, are important is because uh, teachers use the letter names all the time. So children will not know what teachers are talking about during reading and writing instruction if they don't know the letter names that the teacher uses. So when a teacher says H during a lesson, a student should have an immediate association to the printed letter form. So the kind of teaching that we do is going to be you know, saying this is H and having them see that H there as well. So when children can't use the names of letters, they will have less equipment for talking about words and for problem solving when they're trying to spell and read words. So uh, the other thing that we need to know about uh, letter names is that they are metalinguistic. That goes along with the previous bullet. Names give people the, the ability to objectify things. And when we name things and objectify them, we can use them for making decisions. Uh, so it's kind of like in uh, basketball. It's like if you have names for the different moves, uh, different shots and so on, it's like if you can say, okay, do a right-handed layup, do a reverse layup. As soon as you have a name for it and you've seen it a few times, you start to have a better memory for what it actually is. So imagine also letter names as being one of the tools on a Swiss army knife. Once you know what that tool is and what it's for, you can better decide when to use it. Like you can see the little uh, squiggly thing on the side of your, uh, your Swiss Army knife, but until somebody says it's a corkscrew and shows you that it's for opening corks, then it's like, oh, I never, never knew what to use that for before, but now that it's named, and now that I've seen what it's used for, I can remember it better. So meta-language is talk about talk. So we have a whole set of vocabulary words in our language that are just about uh, language. So we have tons of everyday words to do this. So we have words like say, word, sentence, sound, letter, phrase, repeat, uh, louder, verb, noun, talk, listen, ending. Those are all everyday words that are just talking about talk. And then there's a whole other set of technical words that are about language, things that we hear uh, in a more academic vein, things like, uh, things like morphology, a phoneme, a verb clause, a relative pronoun, comprehension, decoding. Uh, these are all more academic terms uh, that you might expect a linguist to use. So uh, when you can name the parts of language and know what they are, uh, are what they're for, uh, you can do more with them, just like any sort of tools. So uh, how do we figure out uh, what letter names kids already know when they enter a kindergarten for us? So there are a few things about testing that we want to check. So the first thing is that letter names need to be known on site. Uh, it can't be something where they have to think about it for three or four seconds. It needs to be almost a split second, a half second to maybe one and a half seconds for them to be naming those letters. Uh, they need to be in any order and they need to be in upper and lower case to be complete. So there are actually 52 letters that way, uh, 26 uppercase letters and 26 lowercase letters. And a typical assessment will look like a page filled with random letters, and children are expected to follow some standardized instructions and just name the, the list of letters that they see put out in a line. And these look different. I'm going to switch screens here to my uh, PDF. Let's see. Yeah, here's a, a, here's a, a copy of the Dibbles test, and this is a, a here's a 
single row and you as a teacher would tell kids start here and point to the G and read across and then tell them to go to the next line and start here and read across. Uh, and kids will need that instruction or else they'll just pop all over the entire sheet and you want them to kind of go in this randomized order that's already been uh, put forward and then uh, you uh, time something like this and this is back onto the the sheet. Letter name tests are often timed because some researchers have found that rapid letter naming is a skill that sets strong readers and writers apart from others. So we're not just looking for um, letter naming, we're looking for that sort of automatic, really quick letter naming. So while you're doing your assessments, you need to pay attention to which letters the child has already mastered for quick naming and which ones they don't recognize or which ones take them more than a second to name. Uh, you do this because you don't want to spend time doing full lesson routines for kids who already know more than half of the letters. Uh, kids who know more than half of the letters uh, need to learn only the ones that they don't know yet. So doing an assessment like this will give you some of that information. I'm going to tag quickly to another article. This is a, a great article. So I've, this is uh, research for teachers. So easy as A, C, H, Q, Z, R, J, Q, the quick letter name knowledge assessment. So Tortorelli, Bowles, and Skibby. Uh, I'm going to scroll right down to the spot where we can get to the actual stuff that they use. So if you read through this, you'll find that they have taken uh, some of the guesswork out of uh, working with, um, with alphabet testing because what they've done here, and I'm just going to sit on this page for a second, is that they've, uh, they've summarized the research uh, on which letters are easier for kids to know in general and which ones are harder for kids to know. And I'm going to touch on a bunch of these in just a moment, but uh, letters that appear to be easier are letters like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, those first uh, six or seven letters. Uh, the ones that uh, appear more frequently in print, like the, um, what would you call them, the uh, oh, uh, Wheel of Fortune letters, R, S, T, L, N, and E. Uh, those are the most common letters in print. And uh, also the, the letters that include sounds that are in the letter name. So B has a B, F has a F. Um, uppercase letters are also easier to identify and so on. So this test actually helps you recognize, okay, have kids mastered the easy ones and the hard ones, and what do they still have left to do? So take a look at this test. It's interesting. Uh, you could also take a good look at the uh, Dibbles test. I'll post both of these for you to be able to look at. Uh, and we'll look at some other, uh, other measures for alphabet knowledge because a lot of these types of tests now have gone onto the computer and are done either on an iPad or on a, a desktop computer. So let's go ahead and go back to teaching the alphabet. So uh, so we're not going to waste direct instruction time. So you save whole class teaching for letters most children don't know. So you only teach those uh, letters to your entire class that you think, okay, almost everybody in the class needs to learn these letters. And for the most problematic letter names. So uh, if you go back to that uh, article, you'll see that there are certain letter names that kids just get confused because the letter name doesn't match what sound it makes and so on. All right. So uh, what about the alphabet song? We already know the alphabet song is this excellent mnemonic, M-N-E-M-O-N-I-C, mnemonic tool uh, for families and for preschool. So it's one of those things that uh, covers all of the letters. They're in a specific order. It's standardized. It's the same for everyone. So it's a great way to give many children an introduction to letters along with the letter names. Uh, and that's especially true if this song is done with clear and direct reference to visuals because you don't want kids just learning the alphabet song without seeing those little graphemes, uh, the, uh, the letters on the page that correspond to each sound in the song, word in the song. So, uh, but uh, that becomes less and less appropriate uh, to lean on. You don't want to lean on that traditional song as your main tool as children progress through kindergarten and first grade. The song's in the same order every time, and kids can memorize it without really knowing the letters. So in parts of the song, uh, kids blend letter names together in ways that make them hard to distinguish as individuals. A really common place where kids really just can't distinguish what uh, one thing from the other is when it gets to the part where it says LMNOP, 
Uh, that just sounds like one word to a lot of kids. Uh, 40, 50 years ago, Big Bird used to sing a song on Sesame Street called Abkadevki Jekylmanop Kristuvuks is because for Big Bird, it just all blended together into one big word. Um, so as teachers, we have to be sure that kids aren't just learning the song and making loose associations to letters. We need to have the point where they say the name of that letter. They need to see that picture that goes with it and have some sense that that's a meaningful chunk in English. So uh, alphabetical order is what the song is in, and alphabetic order has, uh, I'm going to make sure I say this clearly, alphabetic order has nothing to do with how frequently the letters are used. So it has nothing to do with the way phonemes match to letters. Alphabetic order, which is the order of the alphabet song, it's this historical artifact that traces way back to ancient Rome, Greece, and Phoenicia. So we have no control over the alphabetic order. But it is used importantly for sorting words in dictionaries and in office filing and things like that, but it doesn't have a ton of useful applications in K1 instruction. So you might use it to organize tubs of classroom items. Uh, a lot of kindergarten teachers have tubs of classroom items that go with letters of the alphabet or sounds, and also they may need alphabetical order for navigating some parts in, a, in the school library or the classroom library. But the alphabet song is really not a principal strategy for teaching letter names in, uh, in kindergarten and first grade. So what do we do to go beyond the alphabet song? So the first thing you need to do is you need to set up a scope and sequence. And for me, a scope and sequence would be a time when I would go back to an article like this and uh, talk about, okay, which are the hard um, letters and which ones are the easiest ones? And then you need to decide what to do. Uh, so for the kids who know very few uh, letter names, you want to help them get the easiest letter names really quickly. So that's a, an August, September kind of thing. So go back to an article like this and it'll help you plan out your scope and sequence because it'll give you a clear idea of what's easy and what's hard. And then you can start uh, stair-stepping your scope and sequence so that, uh, so that the kids who already know some of the easy letters uh, in August and September, they'll start learning some of the harder letters early on. So you want to have a plan for August, September, October, November, December, January, February, all the way through the end of the school year for what, uh, what, uh, how you're going to stair step from easier to more difficult for each of the kids. And that's going to be in stages, again, because kids who already know half or three quarters of the letter names, all you're going to be teaching them is what they need to know, not every single letter. Uh, as a kindergarten and first grade teacher, you're going to want to have a ton of letter manipulatives. Uh, you're going to want to have tactile letter manipul manipulatives like foam letters, letter tiles, cubes, anything that you can use during teaching, practice, and application, and to put together to make actual words. So these manipulatives can be used instead of flashcards for memory exercises. So let's imagine you've got a table that's full of letter tiles. You can move those letter tile, uh, tiles around and point to them and ask kids to name them instead of having them use flashcards or something else like that. Uh, not a problem for you to have a few uh, sets of flashcards uh, for the alphabet as well. Uh, a lot of uh, letter uh, identification programs work on a multi-sensory principle, getting the kids' bodies involved. So a lot of teachers use programs that associate a specific, and let's make sure I get all of these items in there, a specific word uh, and an action and a sound with each uh, letter name. So for example, in the animated alphabet program, teachers and students chant the letter name. They give a common sound for that letter name, a word and an action, so they would say, K, K, kick, and then while they say the word kick, they actually kick their arm and their leg out at the same time, and it makes the shape of a K. Uh, so uh, that's interesting, and there are a lot of different programs out there that get uh, actions and sounds and letter names involved at the same time, along with a, a key word. Uh, alphabet books, this is important. Uh, alphabet books are usually based on the initial letter in a keyword with an alphabet name, and so that is something that gives letter names clear uses and meanings. Uh, kids who don't know what letters are for need to see that they stand for words that are actually important to them in life. Uh, but each alphabet book has its shortcomings and limitations among them. Uh, you, you know, you might have a uh, 
an alphabet book based on zoo animals, and if this kid has not been to the zoo, or if uh, our zoo doesn't have all of the animals that they have there, you know, it's it's not going to be a strong cultural representation for that kid. So a strong K-1 classroom library should have dozens of different alphabet books for application. So if I walk into a kindergarten teacher's cl uh, classroom and I go to the classroom library, I expect there to be a whole shelf just dedicated to alphabet books. And uh, we as teachers, we need to be on the constant lookout for new and different approaches that help children apply letter names in context so that they're starting to see that, oh, we're learning this alphabet, but uh, it's, it's about words, it's about meaningful things, not just uh, learning things that the teacher told me to. So my question for you immediately is how many alphabet books do you own right now? Uh, I have a Goodreads shelf uh, where I have uh, my all of my alphabet related books already cataloged here uh, and uh, I have a, a healthy shelf of alphabet books in my basement that I uh, pull out when, uh, when I need to. So I'll bring some of those to class and we'll look at them together and talk about their strengths and their shortcomings. All right, let's go back to the lecture. Uh, in addition to books, uh, taking kids out to literature, uh, for kindergarten, much of the knowledge that kids gain uh, in letter knowledge and in phonics and phonemic awareness knowledge is going to come from playing with writing, free writing, open writing, uh, where they're uh, free to write what they wish. So in a social uh, situation, uh, they're more likely to need to talk to each other about letters by name. So we want to have kids writing with each other and talking about what they're writing, asking each other questions about spelling. How would you spell this? How do you think I should write that? Instead of every kid going up to the teacher and saying, uh, tell me how to spell this, you're going to turn the kids over to each other and ask them to talk to each other about how the letters and sounds go with each other. And to, to accomplish that, they'll need to use those letters by name, which will give them a reason for paying attention when you're teaching letter names later on. Uh, so the same time that you're teaching letter names, you're giving them this writing time to help them apply what they're learning. So writing time in K-1 is often a, let's get this as clear, is often a stronger path towards learning letter sounds than reading is. Think about that. Why would it be a stronger path for young kids to, uh, to go through writing rather than reading? It tends to be the case. Uh, kids learn a lot more about letters and phonics and sounds when they're trying to write sometimes in kindergarten and first grade than they do when they're trying to read. Uh, we want to go back to the idea of a name inventory. We talked about this in class with reference to sounds, but we also want to do it for letters. So when children are attuned to their own names as meaningful for reading and writing, a beginning of year name inventory will help you as the teacher to learn whether all the letter names are represented in the student names or not. So if there are a few letters that are not in anybody's student name, or if there's some letters that aren't very frequent, uh, those are letters that are going to need some direct instruction and some application as well. So children who know no letter names or few letter names can start with the letters in their name to assure that they see there's a purpose for learning the letters, just like we talked about before with phonemes and phoneme awareness. So what can you expect to be difficult when you teach letter naming? So it's a different task from matching sounds to letters or phonemes to letters. So we've done a lot of work in this class on orthographic mapping, matching sounds to letters. But knowing the letter names is still helpful for these matching activities. So if I take a, a word like match and I do the orthographic mapping activity, I'm actually saying letter names and then I'm asking kids to give me letter names. So if I take the word match, this word is match, letter M says M, mm, letter A says A, ah, letters T, C, H say CH, and the word is match. Then I can ask the kids to, uh, to tell me which letter says M, mm, and I'm expecting the kids to be able to say M. Uh, kids who don't know the alphabet letters won't be able to respond in an activity like that. So uh, spending the time early on in kindergarten to get many kids solid on these letter names is going to set me up well as a teacher for successful phonics instruction where so much of what I say uses those letter names. So teaching letter names is a whole separate thing that teachers have to plan along with teaching phonics and spelling. It sets you up for success. The other thing that's difficult is that we don't use the same pattern. 
so uh, not using the same pattern every time for the letter names. And let me make sure I'm saying this right. Yeah. So we start with A, then we go to B, C, D, E, and then we switch. We don't use that E, E, E pattern anymore. We go to F, and then we go back to the E pattern with G. H is probably the strangest name. Then we have I, and then suddenly it's J and K. Then L, M, N, a switching of patterns. Then we're back to the start with the E for P. Then a weird one again, Q. Uh, it doesn't even match the sounds that we usually use. It should be Q if we wanted it to match what it usually does in English. R is very different. S and T both follow patterns that have been around before. U is like all of the other vowels. You just say the name of that vowel and there's no Q for what it's supposed to be like. Uh, then V with the EE -E pattern again. W is right up there in weirdness with H, and then we have X, Y, and Z. Uh, and Z uh, follows the pattern. X kind of follows one of the patterns, but Y doesn't follow it. So just to uh, go through those patterns one at a time, nine of the letter names have that E sound. So uh, you could teach all of those as a group. Think about that. Uh, the five vowel letter names are each standalones with no consonants around them. You just say A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y for a vowel. Uh, six of the letter names start with that short E sound. You have F, L, M, N, S, and X. Uh, that's an interesting choice that somebody made. Uh, two of the letter names end with a long A sound, like in day, so letter J and letter K. And those decisions were made to differentiate J from G and uh, K from C. So that's an interesting choice. The only two that are like that but is to keep them separate from two of the other letter names. Uh, the next two, the letter name for Y makes the sound we expect for W. So W and Y we're going to have to do a lot of work with with some kids who just cannot get that straight. And it's because the letter names themselves are confusing. So uh, kids uh, often get, I think the uh, word is going to be confused about Y, yes. So uh, also crazy, the word Y, uh, W-H-Y, is the same as that letter name, but it has a W and a Y in it. So Anyway, so teach these two, uh, W and Y. You're going to have to spend some time with some kids ferreting out, okay, this is the letter W, it says W, this is the letter Y, it says Y, uh, and do some of that sound work with them and so on. Uh, best case scenario is that you'll be able to work on that with, uh, with some people that have those words in their name in less confusing ways. Uh, Q for Q is a, is a unique name. There are no others like it. So R for R is a rogue or a unique name. There are also no others like it. Add all of those up and you get the 26 letters. Uh, the other thing in the article that was mentioned is that the differences between uppercase and lowercase letters is also a point of difficulty because for some letters, like letter A, the lowercase letter doesn't look anything like the uppercase letter. Uh, same thing for the letter D and the letter B. Uh, so think about that. There are easy letters like V and W and X uh, where the uppercase and the lowercase look almost exactly the same. Uh, those, you can usually get them two for one. If you teach X, you only have to teach it once. Uh, show them the big one and the little one. But where they don't look the same, you're going to have to actually spend some time talking about how they look different. So finally, uh, a couple of last bullets there. What if we just used E except for the four vowels, uh, other vowels? So what if the alphabet was A, B, C, D, E, F, G? Sorry, I'll start over. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. He, I, G, Ki, Li, Mi, Ni, O, P, Qui, Ri, C, T, U, V, We, X, Y, Z. Uh, that would be much easier if we had just chosen one sound to go with uh, all of those, uh, those consonants, but we didn't. Uh, so if you want to help kids make uh, some progress, you might be able to give them a more consistent approach to things. Uh, but for me, I'm not going to do something weird like this. It's just interesting to think about the choices that were made in giving the alphabet letters their names and why it's not, why it's not more standardized. Again, it's a historical thing, not something that uh, researchers decided was more effective for kids. 
Last thing, letter X is used, used most commonly in the final and medial positions. Uh, Dr. Seuss's ABC book gets this right. Uh, the quote from that book is, X is very useful when saying ax and extra fox. Uh, it lets you know that, um, that that X sound is more likely to be useful and used in words in that medial or final position. So extra fox, ax. Uh, the Z sound that X makes in Greek loanwords like xylophone and xanthan gum, that's specialized. It's hardly useful for kindergarten and first graders. Uh, and that's a major critique that I have of alphabet books, is that alphabet books usually fail when they get to letters like uh, H and W and Y and X, where there's some really tricky things for young kids to think about. Uh, one other thing that makes uh, learning the alphabet difficult is that some letter names uh, show little or no reference to the sounds that they usually make. So the names for H and Q have almost no resemblance to what those letters do in English words. And uh, all of the vowel letters are used in many combinations to make many different vowel sounds. We've been practicing that in class, and you've gotten used to seeing, uh, for example, for the sound O, seeing an uh, OO as in poor and door, but then seeing an OW as in low and grow, and so on. I think we looked at there being like six, six or eight different uh, sound uh, spelling patterns for that O sound. So anyway, H and Q, these two letter names only represent one possible phoneme that matches the letter, usually not even the most common one. So, oh, I'm sorry, I was talking about vowel letters. Vowel letters are used in many combinations, and those letter names for vowels only represent one possible phoneme that matches that letter, and it's not always the most common one. Okay, C and G each have two standard sounds. C equals k and s, and C borrows from two already existing letters, k and s. G equals g and j, and it has one unique sound, g, that doesn't, uh, no other letter does that, and borrows one from j. So both of these are really interesting situations for English. Uh, y is frequently used at the end of words, including many students' names, without making any kind of consonant sounds, so y. So names like Delaney, J, words like honey, money, key, day, and hey. Uh, kids who already know some words like that may not associate that letter with the y sound. Uh, and so the, uh, the uh, w sound in the letter name Y is still confusing to a lot of kids because of the way it gets used in really common words and in names. So uh, I think that kind of covers everything. Uh, I'll stop and we'll spend some time practicing some of these things in class, looking at some of the assessments and, and, uh, and some of the material from the article that I demonstrated for you. Last thing is that I'm just going to pop out here to my screen again. Uh, I also have one of the main research articles that would be good for you to look at. So why is letter name knowledge such a good predictor of learning to read? Jean-Noël Foulon from France actually goes through uh, much of the research that has happened over the decades showing us that uh, people who know their letter names tend to do better in reading and writing. And interestingly, if you do better in reading and writing in school, you have a much higher uh, chance of graduating. Uh, you won't have as great a likelihood of failing out of school or dropping out of school. So uh, I'll post these articles. Uh, not required reading, but a good place for you to get a sense for what the research says, the science says about alphabet naming. All right. Talk to you soon.